What's up guys, Chris Dallas here from The Last Checkpoint, bringing you the second video in our Unity beginner course. Uh, last time, in our very first video, uh, we created our platform and our player object, which is a sphere. This time, I want to go ahead and give our player object some life. So for our game, I want the user to go ahead and hit either directional keys or the WASD keys to move the sphere in either the X direction for horizontal or the Z direction for vertical. And we'll get sort of a movement like this, only our player will be rotating. Let's go ahead and reset this to zero, this to zero. And so the way we're gonna achieve that desired movement is we're going to apply physics to the player object. And the way you apply physics to game objects in Unity is you give a game object what's called a rigid body. And all a rigid body does, it allows Unity to apply any physics systems that really that you desire as the developer. So we're gonna go ahead and add a rigid body to our player object. See so how the player highlighted in the inspector. I'm gonna go to add component, click it, and I'm gonna type in rigid body. Now there's a rigid body and rigid body 2D. The 2D one is obviously for 2D games. We're working in the 3D space. So we'll select the regular rigid body. And you can already see that the attributes associated with rigid body are all physics based, right? You have your mass, your drag, your angular drag, you actually have a checkbox for use gravity, and so on and so forth. This is the component that we'll use in our script to actually apply forces. So now that the player has a rigid body attached to it, let's go ahead and start creating our script. So we're still on the player object, we'll go ahead and add component, and we'll type in player controller. Now it doesn't know exactly what the player controller is, but it can assume that it's a script. So we'll go ahead and click new script. The name is player controller and our language of choice will be C sharp. We'll hit create and add. And so now we have a player controller associated with the player object and we have a player controller in the project hierarchy. So let's go ahead and be diligent here. Let's create a new folder called scripts. And let's drag our player controller script into the scripts. And let's go ahead and double click and start working on it. So my script opened up in MonoDevelop. If you're working in Windows, it'll more than likely default to Visual Studio. I recommend either MonoDevelop or Visual Studio as they are the best beginner editors and frankly, really good for advanced Unity users. Uh, mine is a darker theme, but you guys will probably start with a lighter theme. You can change themes if you want, but more importantly, they both have autocomplete features and we'll see that in play as we create our script. So if it opens in Visual Studio, you'll be just as fine. For these tutorials, your code will turn out exactly the same and we won't have any problems. Your editor just look a little different. So the first thing you notice is the name of our script, player controller, which we went ahead and named when we created the script right here. And then it gives us two initial methods. The first one is start. This method is used for initialization, as it says here. And the second one is update, which is called once per frame, as this says here. Now, start and update are what are called event functions that get invoked at certain times when your game is actually running. And that's what this initialization and once per frame kind of refer to here. So the first thing we want to initialize is what we just created our player's rigid body because that's where we're going to apply our forces to and that's the way we're going to get our player to actually move based on our input. So we want to create a variable up here first. We'll make it a private variable. It'll be of type rigid body and this is what I'm talking about that autocomplete feature that both MonoDevelop and Visual Studio both have. They're going to both help you and be presumptuous in their suggestions on what you're trying to type. In our case, it knows we're trying to create an object of something. And the first thing it's guessing is rigid body, which is exactly what we want. And you can kind of see in the summary that it's exactly what we need. And if you ever forget what that particular class does, you can go ahead and peek in the summary here, control, control of an object's position through physics simulation, which is exactly what we want to do for our player object. So let's go ahead, hit enter to let it complete itself or type out rigid body, whichever. And so that's the type we need to now name the object itself. So we're going to call it this player RB for rigid body, semicolon to end the statement. Great. 
So now we have a player rigid body object. And so now we need to actually just instantiate it. And lucky for us, Unity provides us with an initialization method from the get go, which we'll use now to instantiate the player rigid body. Let's go ahead in our start method. We're going to say move my cursor out of the way. We're going to say player rigid body. And we're going to set this equal to this. This is a keyword that refers to whatever object this particular script is attached to. So in our case, the player controller is attached to the player object. So this is then the player object. So we'll say this dot. We're going to call a method called get component. And that component that we need is of type rigid body which again is what we instantiated on the player object. And since it's a method, open close parens, semicolon. So we're getting the rigid body component and saving it here to player rigid body. So we always have a reference to it whenever we want to apply force. Now that we have the player body instantiated, let's go ahead and find out how we're going to add force to get the player to move. So normally we would go ahead and work in the update statement next as it's here provided for us. But Unity actually provides a different method for physics-based updates. That method, we'll go ahead and delete this comment here, is called fixed update. Now where update is called once per frame, fixed update is actually called in sync with Unity's physics engine. And so since we're dealing with physics and are going to be applying forces to our player's rigid body, then we need to use fixed update as opposed to update. So the first thing we want to do, I'll put in comments as we go along, is get input from user. Now, if you're new to coding, comments are just statements that you can set up for yourself or for future users of your code um, where you can freely write whatever and it won't get interpreted or invoked when your code runs. We're going to go ahead and create what's called a float object, which is just a fancy word for a number with decimals. We're going to call it move horizontal. We're going to set that to the input get axis. And the axis that we want to get is horizontal. Now this looks like it came out of nowhere, but I'll go ahead and explain. Now you don't have to do this. I'm going to go ahead and just do this for demonstration purposes, but we're going to go ahead and go back to the editor and show you exactly where this comes from. When go down to the edit menu button, project settings, input. And now yours will be collapsed when you open it. But this is the input manager here open in the inspector. We have these things called axes. And when you open it up with the drop down, you'll see different axes listed here. We have the horizontal, the vertical, fire one, fire two, fire three. In our case, we're going to use the horizontal and vertical like we were talking about earlier to make the ball go up and down and left and right. And these are the key names here, horizontal and vertical. We'll take a look at horizontal. And what horizontal takes in for the negative button is left and the positive button is right. And the alternatives are A and D, like the WASD keys. If we open up vertical, you can see that it's indeed S and W and down and up. And so these are what we're using in our code. We're looking for the user pressing either left or right or A or D for the horizontal axis or down or up or S or W for the vertical axis. And the negative and positive is just an interpretation of negative one if down is pressed or positive one if up is pressed. And you'll see how that comes into play. So go ahead and collapse that. Open our code back up. So we're getting the axis of horizontal or the left and right keys on our keyboard or A and D. And so we want to do the same thing for vertical. So we're going to go float move vertical equals input from the user get axis. And this axis is going to be called vertical as we just saw. Now that we have the inputs from our user, we'll go ahead and assign those inputs into what we're going to call a move variable. Now the move variable is going to be of type vector three. I'm going to stay on here for a second so you can see what it is. Pretty much what a vector three is, as it says, the representation of 3D vectors and points. 
fancy speak for vector three is a holder of an X, Y, and Z point in one single object. And for our case, move horizontal is gonna be one point on the vector three, move vertical is gonna be another point, in our case, the Z. And then like we said before, the user is never depicting movement on the Y axis, so that'll be zero. We're gonna say vector three, move equals, and to instantiate a new object, we say new, the name of the object, vector three, open parens, and as we hit open parens, we can see there's three choices for instantiation here. One is empty, make an empty vector three object, and you can assign points of that vector three object manually. Another one is just inputting X and Y, where it interprets Z as zero. And the last one, which we're gonna use, is taking in an X, Y, and Z value. So for the X axis, we're gonna say move horizontal. For the Y axis, again, like we said earlier, we're not having the player depict movement from the Y axis. So we'll put 0, 0.0F. F just saying that this is a floating point number. And the Z axis, we're gonna go ahead and say move vertical. Great, so now we have an object that holds our horizontal and vertical movement, but we're not really doing anything with it yet. We just created the vector three object. Now what we wanna do is we wanna take our player's rigid body and apply a force of this movement so that our player can move based on what the player has input. So we're gonna say player rigid body and the rigid body actually has methods that we can use. In our case, we're going to use a method called add force. And the add force takes into vector three, which is what we just created. And you can see in the summary, it says adds a force to the rigid body. So we're going to select that, add our move variable, close parens, and semicolon. Great. We just have a couple steps left, actually. Now that we've applied the movement to our player, we actually want some way to depict the speed of our object. Because right now it's one or negative one based on what the player is inputted for the horizontal or the vertical. That in turn will move a little slow um, and there's no way of increasing it right now. So what we want to do is create a variable where we can depict the speed outside of this class. So we're actually going to go up back up here to create a new variable, public, so that we can instantiate the speed or depict the speed outside of this class. We'll make this of type float and we'll call it speed. And now we're gonna assume that outside of this class speed is already instantiated. So we're gonna go ahead and multiply the move vector by speed. Perfect. Now there's one more thing that we wanna do for this class and then we'll be done. We actually wanna multiply this by one more variable. We're gonna multiply this by time dot delta time and I'll leave it hovering over here just so you can read it uh, but pretty much time dot delta time is the time between the last frame and the current frame and so what this allows us to do is it makes our movement time dependent as opposed to frame dependent without multiplying by time dot delta time a player that can run this game at 60 frames per second versus a player that can run this game at 30 frames per second or chooses to run this game at 30 frames per second we'll have two completely different experiences as the ball will be moving slightly faster for one player than the other. So to make the experience the same for both players, regardless of their frame rate, we want to multiply by time, that delta time, and make this time dependent. So go ahead and press enter to complete that. Great. We have our player rigid body now, having force added to it by our vector three movement variable times the speed that we're going to depict outside of this class times time dot delta time, which allows this to be time dependent. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and control S to save our script. We'll close this. And now back in our editor, if we go onto the player object, we can see that on the player controller in the inspector, we have this new variable called speed. Now, because we made it public, we can change it up over here. And so let's go ahead and instantiate speed, something to like 100. Let's see how that looks. Control S to save. And now if we press play, and I'm gonna use the WASD keys, feel free to use the directional keys. We can now 
see our ball move. Awesome. So the player of the speed was a little slow for me, at least for how I want this game to run. So let's go ahead and increase the speed. Let's see how 500 looks. Maybe that'll be a little fast. We'll see. Press play. Oh yeah, that feels a lot better. Pretty quick, pretty sleek. Um, great. I encourage you guys to play around with the speed variable on yours. See what kind of control feels good for your player object. And that's pretty much it for this video, guys. So for our next video, I think we're going to go ahead and mess around with the camera. As you guys have seen, I'll go ahead and press play here. That one, the camera's in a kind of awkward situation where you can't tell very well that the ball is moving back and forth. And two, as you just saw there, the camera isn't following the ball or anywhere close to the ball. So we no longer know where it is or where the player is. So in our next video, I want to go ahead and create a third person camera that follows the ball at a certain angle where we have an interesting view of the game. And so we can always track where the player object is. So that'll be the next video, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Follow our channel so you can get updated on more videos in the future. Go ahead and give this video a like and leave us comments below. And we'll see you in the next video.